Hey everybody, thought I'd give this a try. I hope, I hope you can hear me over the rushing waters. Um, you know where I am? I used to come here often, because a road used to go right through here and then go up the hill over there. But about, uh, so I take my bicycle here, I'm west of Eau Claire, and then they closed the road. And I just parked in the dead end, it's a little park now. And uh, it's called Zilly, the, um, this camera's hanging on the um, sign. So let me look at the sign here. Yeah. Zilly, Zilly Park, Dunn County. So it's uh, all of, uh, West Cameron and turns into County E, just across the Dunn County line where Menominee is. And uh, you can come down here and you can see this waterfall. Um, well, that's kind of nice. Anyway, yeah, we're getting close to Christmas. We got one more Sunday of Advent. Uh, I thought today was the school children's um, Christmas concert uh, slash Advent concert, um, but it's next Wednesday. And it's not an evening thing. If you'd like to come, uh, the good news is it's not today, so you can still have a chance to come. Uh, it'll be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, December 21st. Okay, so right now it's Wednesday, December 14th. Um, all right, so let's see what we got here. Hopefully you can hear me all right. I hate to do this whole talk and then you can't hear me. Um, well, some parish news. Let's, let's talk about Christmas masses, 469. Two weeks ago I said 468. 469, midnight, and then nine the next morning. Um, in terms of uh, choirs, so the um, the uh, Val, Val and the Ace Choir uh, will be at the 6 o'clock Mass, beautiful sound. The uh, 9 p.m. Mass Christmas Eve will be the uh, adult choir that always makes me laugh because I think we're all adults here, but um, except the children. Um, so... And then, so the other masses, the four o'clock Christmas Eve will be a cantor and musician, and the uh, midnight mass will be a couple families uh, providing music for that. And uh, the 9 a.m. mass, I think, is cantor and musician. So uh, look forward to that in case, uh, in case you want to make your selections based on choirs. The two big choirs will be at the 6 p.m. and the 9 p.m. All right. Um, photo directory. I guess I guess people got my uh, recorded phone call uh, yesterday. Um, the word went out to all the corners of the earth. Get your photo taken. Um, so again, I hope that wasn't too annoying. We're just following the protocol of the directory company. Um, let's see. Yeah. So if you can, in the weekends, those sign-up sheets, the papers will be right there in the gathering space. That's how I did it last week. Heard there were some problems. People, Some people did it real smoothly in, with the technology from the website and the links. Other people had trouble. Uh, apparently, like, for the next 15, 20 minutes after my robocall went out, the, the lines were flooded as people called into the office and, and Ann had quite her hands full. So, some with people signing up, I think, and some with people are having trouble signing up. Um, anyway, that was good. So that's coming up. Those start uh, January 2nd, I think, and uh, the 3rd, and then go through January in little two, three-day chunks. And not just on the weekends and not just during the week. It's kind of a variety of times. So that'd be good. Um, hey, so my favorite prayer service of the year is coming up on Monday. Yeah, it's also when the Packers play the Rams. Monday night, but um, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. You might just miss the beginning of the game. So um, 7 p.m. Monday, we will have uh, word and music for days of holy darkness. We got a few new uh, reading selections, a few that I resurrected from past years, um, and then some beautiful music. So we'll have a reading, pause, a song that matches the theme of the reading, pause, then another reading, just an hour of meditative uh, in the dark. It will be streamed if you want to do it at home. I'd encourage you to come to church. I think it's, uh, we'll have all the snowstorm over by Monday, I hope. I think I think that's the forecast. Cold, though. Um, 
especially if you feel like Advent sort of passed you by. And, uh, you, you, you know, these days of holy darkness to uh, really prepare for the coming of the Lord and Christmas feast. And Advent, if we have the time and the timing is right for us spiritually, it can be such a great period of four weeks to really, um, you know, think about our life and our world and pray. And, you know, the days get dark earlier, so there's not really but it's more time to, to reflect because we're not outside bicycling or walking or playing bean bags uh, so anyway it's a great especially if you feel like Advent sort of passed you by this will be a nice hour of meditation and, and prayer I think uh, there'll be one scripture and a lot of a few poems um, uh, exhortation from Pope Francis things like that um, pretty good Okay, so that's some parish news. Any other parish news? Let's see. Um, I think maybe not. You know, just kind of read the bulletin and stuff. I think our, our collections are going well for the gloves and mittens and the Christmas lights to recycle if you have that need. Um, PCCW, they were... It was like a beehive. I walked in on Saturday morning, I think it was, and they had uh, they all these Swedish cookies they made, the little sand buckles and rosettes, and um, they packaged them up with a poinsettia and took them out to a lot of our a lot of our parishioners who are more uh, of, the, of the older variety. And so I'm sure that was much appreciated. Uh, I just love to see people serving others with joy and that's what I saw it was kind of frantic as they were trying to get everything right and I know there was I guess there was some mix-ups and who ordered what and stuff but uh, hopefully that the frustrations are passed and we can just enjoy the fact that this large group of women really served our parish and our elderly population very well um, and even even had an extra so I'm gonna take a poinsettia to my mom so thanks PCCW um, hey Felicitations à la France. Uh, oh, it's been too long. I had that in, in high school. But so sorry, Bridget, if you're watching this. I know you're a great French speaker. But soccer, or football, uh, they won. They beat uh, Morocco today. I just, I just watched it. They have a player named Mbappe, who is excellent. He's born in Paris. I don't know if his parents maybe were immigrants. It doesn't sound like a French name so much as I think of them, but, you know, that's kind of nationalistic to say. I just, uh, it's great. Um, so, he had a great play, a great assist, and the guy knocked it in, and it kind of took him over the top over Morocco. Honestly, I was I was pulling for Morocco, uh, partly because they were the underdog. Partly, I felt I was following in the footsteps of our recent saint who we highlighted last uh, Lent. We had the prayer cards, remember that saint's name? Charles de Foucault. Uh, we had his prayer of divine abandonment that we I gave. We had cards with that prayer on it, and uh, he made me pray for Morocco because his story. He was he was kind of born French, you know, de Foucault. De Foucault. That's a pretty French name, as I think of French names. And um, well, he, he, you know, he was born into, I don't know, we call it the aristocratic class or something, but he went to, like, military school. He could have been, like, a military officer. I think he even was for a while. But he, he um, gosh, I forget what's so interesting are people's stories of conversion, but, gosh, I can't remember if there was an event or what happened, but he really, he had this great conversion to want to just live simply in the hidden life of Christ like the years of Nazareth that we never hear about. So he just wanted to be a, he actually moved to Nazareth and and was a servant. And I, I think he was a, eventually during that time he was ordained a priest, but nobody even knew about that. He just did it so he could celebrate mass with maybe by himself or someone else. And he had a deep devotion to Jesus present in the Eucharist. Um, but he just wanted to be kind of an invisible servant behind the scene. So I think it was a convent where he worked. And uh, but then eventually, you know, he felt this thirst for the desert. And he went to Algeria and I think eventually to Morocco. And, um, and just lived among mostly Muslim people and had his own place. He had a, a 
uh, like a tabernacle area in his very simple home. And he would celebrate mass there every day. And he grew his own vegetables and he worked a little bit. And everything he might have earned from selling his vegetables or whatever else he did, he'd give away at the end of the week. And it's still, it's still just, it's, you know, it's really something, isn't it? That everything you earn, you spend what you need for yourself to buy your food and all that, and then, then he'd give away whatever he had. And he wanted to, he wasn't, um, he wasn't uh, out there trying to have the Muslims believe in Jesus. He just, but it's very clear that he believed in Jesus, and he wanted to be a, a beautiful, loving presence there. And um, I don't know if there's really stories of a lot of conversions or not, but I, I like that. I want to, I want to take my deep faith in Christ and my desire for communion with Him, and I'm going to live out in the desert among uh, people of different culture and be with them in a loving way. That's that's what he did. Um, so anyway, I thought his movement from France as a you know, young uh, bon vivant to uh, uh, a monk of great uh, austere lifestyle uh, in Morocco. I thought, well, I'm going to root for Morocco. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't win. They lost to France. So now France is going to play Argentina, or as Pope Francis would say, Argentina. Uh, that's his team, right? That's where Pope Francis is from, Argentina. So... Um, you ever see the two popes? It's on a, it's a net produced by Netflix and on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's available on other means or not, but it's a, a you know a fictionalized, imaginative story about Pope Benedict, his resignation, Pope Francis's becoming pope, and then kind of their relationship in the immediate kind of aftermath, and. Um, it's very charming. It's a video. It's Anthony Hopkins and uh, Jonathan Price. So really top-notch actors, and, and a lot of there's a lot of humor. A lot of you know they're, they're kind of very different sorts. Kind of a, a, a stolid German Germanic Benedict, and a, a more yeah, let's enjoy life. You know, kind of uh, Pope Francis. So they're in the they're in the washing their hands in the restroom, and I think Pope Francis is humming a Beatles song. <laughs> Eleanor Rigby, and he's trying to explain to Pope Benedict what who the Beatles were and stuff like that. And, uh, but then Benedict shows uh, Francis that he can just play the piano, classical piano, so beautifully, and he's touched by that. You know, so it's kind of these a little bit like the Odd Couple, you know, not not as uh, you know slapstick as that. Um, so really a serious movie, but a lot of and it ends with those two enjoying the World Cup when Germany's playing Argentina, and I think that actually happened. The game, I don't know what they watched it together. It's, as popes, but uh, anyway, I, I thought it was a great movie, showing that you know the difference and the charity and the love between them, even though they maybe think differently about some things. So, anyway, Argentina is back in the back in the World Cup, so that makes Pope Francis happy, I am sure. A um, couple things from staff. Um, well, we, re we reviewed a, a, an article about community. I, um, it was from the last book club book that we read, uh, Streams in the Wasteland by Andrew Arndt. And he had a chapter that I thought was so important and beautiful about how Christ is found in community. And not, not just like I can find Christ over there when I see that community, but in and through the community. So when we have a sense that we are um, in the care that we show one another Christ is present I was we had a retreat last night that Kelly and Beth put on for uh, catechists and um, I mentioned to them I said uh, who's, who's, who's the minister who does this who does who's the minister of the sacrament at a wedding does anybody know and, and one or two of them knew um, because the priest is the minister of the sacrament for Eucharist, confession, anointing, baptism, all that. But a, a, what, marriage is different. At marriages, I just watch. And the actual ministers of the sacrament are the bride and groom. And, you know, why is that? It's because um, of what they're saying with their sincere hearts. That I'll be with you for the rest of my life. I'll, I will not leave you. And... Um, that's that's 
the love of God. It's not just the love of people, that's, that's the love of God. That's the essence of God's love for us. And so Christ is, is present there. It's like Christ is present in the, you know, what appears as a piece of bread after we pray it and we say the words and, you know, we share it. So uh, Christ is present there when they're saying, I will be with you for the rest of my life. Um, that's I always like that's beautiful. So, I mean, by extension, so when we're, you know, um, you're in your family, you know, everybody, families wants to have a great Christmas together, right? You know, if there's that, I know families can really be, you know, times of people being upset and impatient and frustrated and slamming doors and there's all that too. Um, but we you know when there is forgiveness, when there is re reconciliation, when there's a desire to make things better, when people say, yeah, I do, I want to have a great Christmas and um, I want to be with you people, you're, the, you're my life, you're my family. Uh, you know, Christ is present. It's not just it's not just that we're doing things that Christ would do or that Christ wants us to do and he's up in heaven there somewhere, but he's there because God is love and when you're loving like that, you're there. And same thing like in a parish. So um, I, I hope more and more to kind of be aware of this. I was, was I telling somebody, I guess it was all to retreat last night, but um, so honestly, Honestly, I used to, uh, so I, I, there, there was, uh, maybe I wrote this in both. Anyway, there's this, uh, I had some friends from out of town come last week and they came to St. James the Mass and they said at the, at the way out, uh, sometimes I'm a little vulnerable, like when I preach, I, I don't know if people liked it or not or something like that. And especially as a younger man, I'd always kind of want to, I'd always kind of want to hear, hey, nice homily, Father, nice homily. And um, that's all, you know, I, we always love to be encouraged, whatever it is, but I'm, I'm liking that. You know what I like even more? People leave, and uh, like these, these friends of mine from out of town, they said, wow, you have really have a great sense of community here. You know, we don't find that where we are. And I think, you know, they feel a sense of warmth, or, or I don't know, that they're welcome, that they're supposed to be there, that it's good. Um, I'm not sure exactly what people mean always when they say a sense of community here, but um, I thought that's just you know, awesome. So the more we can kind of hang in there with each other and um, really show genuine concern for each other, you know, at, at St. James and the parish, um, whether it's through activities outside of Mass, or they say that Mass is, uh, the Eucharist is supposed to be the source and the summit of Christian life. So you know, a source that, you know, we're fueled, we're inspired, we hear the word of God, we want to imitate Jesus, we want to be that that bread, blessed, broken, and given for the life of the world. And uh, so it's the source of, you know, we go out and, and try to be great with our families, our neighbors, uh, people that we don't even maybe like that much, but we know are part of our lives. And so we want to show uh, love to them and, and find a way to get along and be together. And, uh, you know, we're in our parish. And then, uh, you know, if, if we do that well, and we're always a little, you know, flawed, of course, in our attempts, so we begin Mass with the Lord have mercies, you know, forgive us, pick us up again. And then, then Eucharist again, and, 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 and as it's our source of energy, it can also be our celebration. It's like, yes, this is, this is who I want to be. We're all coming up from different directions to receive the body of Christ. And uh, when we are living as we ought, we are the body of Christ. And, and we, we don't just, you know, worship God that's, that's far away, but that's in and through the way we treat each other. Um, so that's a little bit what we were talking about. That was in that chapter. And I, I think I'm growing more sensitive to that. And I, I think it's beautiful. Um, and it feels a lot more whole or holy or good or right than just me and my journey trying to sense God's love for me. Or, you know what I mean? Um, so, and we have so many, so many people that just uh, mirror that kind of love that make our community a place where Christ is encountered, you know? So, a little, little push for that. I thought that was great. A um, couple, couple things. We had, a, toward the end, Patrice was just on a roll with a ton of wisdom stuff. She's, one funny thing she said, <clears throat> with a lot of deep truth, though, she said a child came up to her after mass last weekend and and came right up to her and said, hey, you like me, don't you? 
And she said, well, yes, I do. How do you know? How did you know that? And she said, just from the way you look at me. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Just the way you look at me, I can tell that you like me. I told him afterwards, Father Hegel uh, is friends with the retired Archbishop who died a couple years ago. His name was uh, Raymond Hunhausen. And uh, <clears throat> after his retirement, Father Hegel asked him, he said, hey, uh, what are you up to in your retirement? And he goes, not much. Mainly I'm practicing the art of the benevolent gaze. The art of the benevolent gaze. So I'm looking, with, I'm looking at people with love. And that's my ministry right now. And I, I, obviously, I remember that. I heard that story probably 15 years ago. Um, and that's, I think that's what was happening with Patrice. She was, had a benevolent gaze, and it made a difference. You like me, don't you? Isn't that great? I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, and this other thing is a little more nuanced, but I'll mention it in case I forget it, because I thought it was really important. So sometimes when we're Christians, we try to or we're trying to follow Jesus, I should say. We're about giving, we're about, you know, trying to, to give, and, and sometimes people don't always respond to that, or maybe we feel rejected, or, you know, the situations aren't healable like we'd like them to be, you know, and so it can be frustrating if we don't get the results that we'd like uh, from our giving. And uh, so she said something like, uh, you know, that's because you're focusing on being a on giving rather than just being a certain way. Because if the focus is on your giving, then you'll feel empty because you're giving away. But if, just, if it's just the kind of way you're being, you're trying to be a loving person, that's who you are, then you're not emptied afterwards. So right now, that's just an idea in my head. That's an idea I don't want to forget. That's, that really sounded beautiful to me. Uh, it could solve a lot of cases of burnout among people in ministry or in the helping professions, um, which I've never felt uh, susceptible to, by the way, but, uh, but people are, I mean, it's a real thing. But anyway, I thought that was good. Last, I just want to talk a wee bit about, oh, did I show you an icon? Last week I had the icon of Joseph and Mary going to the Holy Land on the donkey. How about this one? Pretty, right? So Joseph's asleep and he's dreaming and the angel speaks, right? And the angel says, don't do it. Don't divorce Mary quietly. It's by the Holy Spirit that she is pregnant with child. Don't you stay with her now because she needs you. Okay, okay. And then, then Joseph <coughs> wakes from his dream and did as the angel said. Isn't that awesome? Some people, scholars say it's a dream because Joseph of the Old Testament was a great dreamer and interpreter of dreams. Um, but I, I always give Joseph the credit. We were marveling uh, uh, at the staff today about how, you know, Mary is in broad daylight when, when an angel appeared to her. I'd be a little easier to believe than a dream. But anyway, so I thought I wanted to share that image with you. John on the Cross. So John on the Cross is his feast day today. As we say, in, <clears throat> as you would say in Argentina, Juan de la Cruz, he's actually from Spain, 1500s. So it was after the Reformation, after Christendom was kind of splitting up, Spain was still a very Catholic country, um, but in need of a lot of reform. And so he was a reformer, he was a Carmelite. Um, he and Teresa of Avila were the great Carmelite reformers, people that wanted to be sisters and priests and brothers in those religious orders and live a single life in community. Well, they were getting a little soft, I guess, and, and they wanted to, uh, to, I, you know, reform it, to change it, to make it more after a, a thirst for Christ and all his simplicity. So they were called discalced Carmelites, which means uh, uh, no shoes. <laughs> so that was a sign of their austerity, that they, they didn't wear shoes. Um, but that, you know, that's not what he's most, he was actually uh, Teresa of Avila's spiritual director. He's mostly known for being a mystic. So what do we mean when we say mystic in the church? You know, it's someone who has a pretty constant awareness, pretty intense experiences of prayer, and a pretty constant awareness 
not just of God, but of, of how they live in God, and God lives in them, and we kind of a, a union with God, and uh, you know, every everything that they see is kind of through that lens. Um, so he wrote a lot. He wrote a lot of poetry, a lot of commentaries on his poetry about the spiritual life and prayer. Um, I took a class on him. I wanted to look up my old notebooks. Everybody wanted to take this class. There was only about 12 people in. My seminary had probably 175 people in it or something. And I don't know how many were vying for these 12 seats, but um, I remember meeting with Father Canary the night before. I said, you know, I could, I, could you get me? I don't usually do that. I was usually, but I thought, you know, I'm such not a morning person, and to get in his class, people would wake up at four or five in the morning and stand outside the, the registrar's office so they could be in line in time to get in the class. <clears throat> I thought, well, it doesn't hurt to ask. So I said, you know, you know, I stay up later and I don't get up early too much, and, and uh, I really want to take the class. What do you think? You, do you think you? <laughs> I'm embarrassed that I even. I don't usually do. That. Anyway, I did though. I asked if I could. I guess I was desperate for that sleep, and. Uh, he just kind of smiled at me and he said, yeah, I think you should get up early. <laughs> and I said, okay, fair enough. Uh, anyway, um, he, um, he talked about the fancy words are the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way. And It's kind of like if you want to really be close to God, the first step is to purge, to, to be rid of everything that's not of God. You know, so it's a little bit like the Desert Fathers did. So uh, if um, you know, if, if if you're like things of the flesh, if you're eating too much and that, and you're relying on that for comfort when you're stressed or something, you know, knock it off. You know, the purgative way, or some activities or hobbies that you have, if they're not uh, leading you to God, uh, you know, be be done with the purgative way. Uh, if you're um, just having trouble praying and sitting down, getting your butt on a chair or on a cushion or however you pray, on a kneeler, um, you know, do it. You know, force yourself to do it. Put yourself in that posture. So it's a lot, the purgative way, it's kind of a lot of work. You know, it's the things that maybe bring us comfort but that don't draw us closer to God. We do with them. So it's kind of a Lenten thing. And then he, then he would say that gradually over time to replace that vacuum of the desires to be filled with God, you, you receive illumination. You get insights about God. You, you come to believe and to know more and more confidence that God is with you. Um, you know, it's the rising. So it's the dying of the pur purgative way, saying notice things, and then rising with things. And then, uh, and then the unitive way is when you kind of just sort of, you've been walking that path so long, it's a, it's a great grace where you just really feel at one with God. Um, in union with God, and I don't know, you know, how many people experience that. Maybe in in moments we'll have a moment like you might come to a place like this and not want to leave and just kind of be here and be present to that and have gratitude in your heart. And maybe that's a unitive experience, uh, experience of union with God. Um, so he's also the one that coined the term the dark night of the soul. So people who have been uh, you know, where is God in my life? I pray, I don't feel anything. Mother Teresa apparently had a very elongated dark night of the soul. Uh, you, you know, he talks about that and he writes about that. And the, the idea is just to continue to stay faithful to your prayer, be faithful to a life of charity. God is with you and uh, he will pick you out of that darkness and, and, and be, be, you'll be enlightened and filled with life at one point. Maybe not in this life. That's, that's, the, hard, that's the hard thing. I really like him, and he, and he said, if you want to get to a place you know that God is incomprehensible, it's these mystics, it's like you can never really understand God, but you can be loved by God, and you can love God, and I can be present to that love. And, and, and if I'm not there yet, and I'm going to try to get there, if I'm going to get to a place and I don't really know how it is, I'm going to have to go by a path that, that I don't know how it is, maybe an unfamiliar path. You know, everyday life, just think about moving. If I got to move, start a new job, it's, it's going to be hard. It's something I'm not familiar with. And, and all, everything along the way is going to be new. And so we have to, you know, sort of trust God. And we don't have all the comfort that maybe we'd expect. And we can just kind of hang in there.
Uh, so he had a deep confidence in the love of God that was on the cross. Okay, I see it's 30 minutes, so uh, let's uh, let's take this in a little bit here. They said that uh, John of the Cross, uh, Dan Schutte wrote a song that we'll sing on Monday night as based on the writings of John of the Cross and maybe particularly that dark night experience. So I'll sing that refrain. Holy darkness, blessed night, heaven's answer hidden from our sight. As we await you, O God of silence, we embrace your holy night. God bless you.